We now come to a very pleasurable part of today's proceedings, um, which is the presentation of a Clay Research Award jointly to uh, Jason Miller from Cambridge and Scott Sheffield from MIT in recognition of their groundbreaking and conceptually novel work on the geometry of the Gaussian free field and its application to the solution of open problems in the theory of two-dimensional random structures. And before we the presentation is made, we have a famous film star uh, who has come to uh, speak about uh, their work. Uh, so Wendelin Werner uh, is also, uh, uh, well, he's moved on from that career. He's a professor at um, ETH in Zurich. In 2015, he was a, a Clay Senior Scholar at the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge. And in 2006, he was awarded a Fields Medal for his contributions to the development of the, of the stochastic Loebner evolution, the geometry of two-dimensional Brownian motion, and conformal field theory. So, Wendelin. Thank you very much. So, um, I have to say that this is one of the you know, nicest parts of our moments in our academic uh, uh, life, when you have to uh, speak, you know, or, uh, you know, tell a distinguished audience about some nice maths, nice maths done by very nice people, and uh, try to convey some of the, you know, uh, uh, beauty uh, that uh, I think I perceive in, in, in that, that work. And also, um, in some sense, I would like uh, to congratulate the Clay uh, Foundation for having made such a great choice, rather than congratulating the <laughs> you for, um, uh, and um, I, I remember that um, for, for this, uh, that in, you know, uh, back in when the Clay Awards were first uh, given that they were, you know, uh, Stasmanov and Odette Tram uh, were, you know, recognized uh, early on uh, by, by the Clay uh, Foundation and that, that played a very important role for all of us to feel that, you know, the, this part of probability theory also was recognized and, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I'm very glad to see your two names on this very distinguished list uh, that, uh, of uh, award winners. So, uh, so I just say two few words about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jason and uh, Scott's career. They have uh, two common points, which is that uh, uh, even though their PhDs were, I think, eight years apart, uh, they have followed more or less uh, the same trajectory uh, eight years apart, meaning that they both had the same uh, PhD supervisor in Stanford, uh, which was Amir Dembo, and then they both went to uh, do a postdoc uh, at Microsoft Redmond uh, in, uh, near Seattle, in Seattle. Uh, well, uh, Scott had uh, the chance to interact directly with Odette Tram and uh, uh, Jason uh, arrived a, a bit later, uh, but uh, probably got some of the spirit of uh, Odette uh, with him in, uh, and that I think lives also in everything that they have been doing since uh, about this relation, uh, understanding the Gaussian free field and its geometry. And then they've moved east, and as you know, as you heard, uh, Scott is now a professor at MIT, and uh, uh, Jason even went much further east, and uh, since he's uh, here in the UK uh, since a couple of years. So the, the topic, uh, I mean, the, the main player maybe of, of, of uh, one of the central key figures in their, in their work is what we like to call the Gaussian free field. And so, uh, of course, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fly back to Zurich to give my lecture about the Gaussian free fields to my students tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, this is not supposed to be, a, you know, a, a lecture, uh, introductory and a rigorous thing. So I, I just want to, to say, you know, that we learn in probability theory that, uh, you know, the one-dimensional random curve, right, the random function, the fluctuations away from the real line, uh, so you may think of a violin string attached at both ends has length one and attached at both ends that uh, has to be zero. That we learn that you know the random fluctuation of this thing is something like a Brownian motion. It's actually called a Brownian bridge. It's conditioned to be back at the you know at, at time zero it's here at time one it's back to zero. 
And we teach our students that Brownian motion is a nice function, it's a very intuitive object. Uh, and, um, and there's this little moment when we have to actually prove that the object we construct is actually a function and, and a continuous function. And that the fact that Brownian motion is actually continuous is not something that is totally uh, obvious uh, from the mathematical definition. Now, what the Gaussian free field is, is what, what, you try to get, what you get when you try to generalize instead of looking at a function from the interval zero, real value from, from the interval zero, one into R, you look at a random function that is now defined, say you, you take in the two-dimensional disk, and you want to find a random function, real valued function, defined on the disk, which is, say, attached at uh, the boundary of the disk and equal to zero at the boundary of the disk, in the same way this one was equal to zero at the boundary of at zero one. So in some sense, the, the way you want to think of it is like that, and you have some sort of, you know, if it, what you're looking at is sort of the canonical random mountain landscape that you can define uh, attached at the boundary of the origin. Or the other way to say is that, you know, you have a, instead of a violin string, you have a tambourine skin, and you look at somehow maybe the distortions of this object, right? And this random object uh, that is sort of the generalization of Brownian bridge when you replace time by a two-dimensional thing is this object called the Gaussian free field. And uh, it's not very difficult to work out what this object has to be, how to define it. And, and also, of course, physicists have done that you know, uh, from you know, a long time ago. Uh, because it's a very natural question to ask, you know, if at each point in space there is something that you can measure, which is an observable, like a real number, and then you try to look at what are the natural ways to, uh, you know, have these numbers interact uh, in, in, the, in space. Okay, so this is the Gaussian free field. And as I told you here that the, the, the Brownian motion was actually a continuous function, what happens here is that this object, even though it's easy to define, turns out it's not a function, right? So the idea is that you, what will happen is that the Gaussian free field will be both plus minus infinity everywhere, right? So it will not be a continuous function. It will only be a generalized function, okay? So what you can make sense of, you will not be able to make sense of the value of the field at the given point. That doesn't make sense, but what you can make sense of is say, you know, the average height of the field on a circle or the average height of the field on an open domain. These are the type of objects that you can make sense of. Okay, so it's a somewhat mysterious object. And what, you know, if you are coming from, you know, if you are curious uh, probabilist, you say a Brownian motion, oh, that's a strange function, it has lots of strange, let's have a look at how how it behaves and so on. And here you learn it's actually not, you know, you can't draw anything. So your first reaction is, well, let's leave it like that and work with it and we'll produce, you know, correlation functions and like the type of things that, uh, you know, in, in physics has been uh, very much, you know, the central point of trying to understand fields via the way they act on correlation functions. Not So basically look at, you know, what happens sort of point-wise, how things interact. But uh, nobody somehow expected that inside this object that you had here, you could actually figure out that, that there was a whole zoo of actually concrete geometric information in there. Okay. So that there were geometric description of this random generalized, canonical random generalized function. And uh, so maybe I'm going to illustrate that with the first result of uh, by, by uh, Scott and, and, and Jason, uh, which uh, goes as follows. And that's some, uh, uh, so maybe the first part of, first group of results have to do with exactly this idea that if you, you are given a sample of this random generalized function, which is this Gaussian free field, then inside this random function, you have in a deterministic way, you can detect lots lots of curves that live in there that you can interpret as some sort of topographic maps or level lines or generalized level lines, random curves that are sitting in there. 
and that you can really describe as such. So even though the, you know, it's not a mountain, it's this plus minus infinity everywhere, it will have you know, some cliffs, some you know, things that you can actually describe there. And so as an illustration, I will maybe give one of their very first results on that, uh, which goes as follows. So this gives you a recipe to an alternative description, you know, geometric description of this Gaussian free field. So the idea is that there's an object you know, there's a collection of random curves, of random loops, like here, which is called a conformal loop ensemble CLE4. So the idea is, it's what I'm drawing here is a random fractal set. So you are removing lots of open sets, disjoint open sets, in such a way that the area of what is remaining in between is zero. Right? So this is a random fractal uh, subsets, the black stuff, and you have these random uh, green curves. Now what happens is that you got what we're going to do is we, you, for each of these interior things, you toss a coin, whether it's a plus one or a minus one. And now we define a simple height function, which is just a function equal to one here, minus one here, and here we don't care because it has area zero, so if you take the main area, you know, av average height of something, you, get, you don't care. Now what you do is inside of each of these loops, you do the same again. Right? So there's a simple recipe to construct in an iterative way, and uh, sort of like that, nested collection of loops in each of those loops, and there's a lot of independence going on, so you do it like that, and here again, for each of those loops, you toss a fair coin to decide if you go up or down. So now, because you were already at level minus one, maybe this one goes down again, and this one goes up again, and it gets a zero. Right? So after the second layer, you just have a function that sometimes is equal to two, sometimes to zero, sometimes to minus two in this area. And you iterate this procedure, you get a random function gamma n. Okay, after n iterations, you get a function that takes its value in minus n, uh, I mean, up to n. And what they prove, what comes out of their analysis is that this gamma n, when you let n go to infinity, converges in distribution to a Gaussian free field gamma. It's exactly the Gaussian free field. So now you sort of see, if I take a given point here, it will be surrounded by infinitely many nested loops. And indeed, this collection of heights you know, around this, on, on this infinite set nested collection of loops will be a random walk that goes up and down. So it's, it oscillates from plus infinity to minus infinity, typically. So you can't make any sense of the value of the height of the field at that point. However, what you see is that the Gaussian free field will be completely described by this sort of topographic level line, collection of level line, of cliff lines, that you can describe in this way. Okay? So that's just an illustration of how inside this complete, you know, some, some object where we're told it's, it's crazy, it's a random generalized function, it's very irregular. Actually, there is a lot of geometry, there are lines in there, and you can describe, you know, unravel what this random collection, you know, what this Gaussian free field is via these lines. That's the first illustration. So, of course, then they, they, what, what one of the results they have is that not only you have these level lines, you have also more general lines, I mean, you know, other type of lines. These curves are fractal type curves. These are the, one of these SRAMs uh, SLE curves. And in particular, this, you know, understanding, embedding all these SLE curves inside the Gaussian free field in this way enabled them to solve one of the major open problems in the, you know, SLE uh, theory which was the fact that if these, when an SLE curve has double points, then the law of the curve from A to B, which is defined in a very directional way, is actually the time reversal of the curve defined from B to A. So, you know, something, uh, some fundamental feature of, of these SLE curves could be solved by embedding them somehow inside, viewing them not only as defined in the usual Loewenau equation sense, dynamical sense, by embedding them in this two-dimensional structure. That's one uh, thing I want to mention. Now, the second illustration I want to give is, uh, has to do with how the Gaussian free field can be used to uh, prove, uh, you know, to, you know how, why is it useful and how uh, can, can it be, you know, uh, uh, 
used to say something relevant for theoretical physics. So here the basic question is to say you are looking at a two-dimensional Euclidean uh, uh, geometry and you ask the question what is the natural way to perturb the, uh, the two-dimensional Euclidean geometry? And that's a question that, you know, what's the natural oscillation away from Euclidean distances? And that's a question that physicists have, uh, you know, thought about, of course. And uh, in particular, I think one of the main names uh, here is sort of Polyakov at, at Princeton. Here at, uh, I mean, here in, uh, in, 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 in Oxford, uh, John Cardi, of course, is, uh, you know, in these two-dimensional random geometries as well on the physics side. Uh, and here, what Polyakov realized was that one natural way to make sense of the physically relevant natural uh, perturbation of the Euclidean geometry was to take the Gaussian free field, which in a way is the random generalized function, and just to try to, you know, take the random area measure, which, which is just, you know, uh, given you know, in the plane by take a Gaussian free field, exponentiate it, so then you get some positive uh, object, and now you just view this as the new density function of your, uh, you know, with respect to the Euclidean uh, area measure. So there are good reasons for that, you know, it's sort of the Gaussian free field has natural Markovian properties, you know, sort of propagation of, of things from nearest neighbors, and you would expect the physically relevant thing to, you know, inherit that. So this doesn't make any sense because this is a generalized function. You take the exponential of the generalized function. What is it? Turns out it's not very difficult to, to make sense. You know, you first regularize the field. You take the exponential of the regularization. You let the epsilon go to zero, and you show that the object you get in the end is sort of independent of the type of regularization you've chosen. Okay? So this will work in dimension two only when gamma is not too large. So there's a cutoff that has to do with the gamma, you know, has, can't, isn't allowed to be larger than two when you try to do that. So, right, so the idea is to say where the Gaussian free field is large, the area is large. When the Gaussian free field is small, the, you know, it's very negative, the area is, is zero. And you, you know, hidden behind this exponential, you have some renormalization feature. So for each gamma, the idea is that the mass, the area will be sort of, you know, located at points where the Gaussian free field is pretty big, you know, somewhere where it's infinity somewhere, uh, but it's sort of still spread in some, some weird fractal way. Okay? So that is the, 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 this object. So one thing is that the Gaussian, so this defines a random, so say if you are on the unit disk, you can also try to do that on the sphere. This defines your random area measure, right? On, on the, in the domain D for each gamma. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, Scott and Jason uh, did was to show a lot of interaction between these random area measures and how they interact naturally with some of these SLE curves that I've mentioned before. And in particular, because of special properties of some of these SLE curves, it turns out that one value seems to be very, you know, very canonical and has to be having to do with just, you know, square root of a third shows up here. It's a bit of numerology. I haven't told you how the Gaussian free field was normalized, so this uh, it does. Okay. So there is one that looks uh, pretty uh, a good candidate for something nice. Uh, now, another feature I want to to mention is that the Gaussian free field, being the canonical uh, random surface, it it has some it inherits some conformally, conformal invariance properties from its very definition. And the conformal invariance property will be just something like, you know, I, I take a tambourine skin Gaussian free field defined in a round tambourine, a Gaussian free field defined on a square one, right, whatever that means, you know, attached to zero here on the boundary of the disk. Or but, and here I use Riemann's mapping theorem to transform horizontally on the horizontal direction the, the disk into the square. I have my surface, well, I just push the surface, you know, I get a random mountain here, I apply Riemann's mapping theorem, I get a random uh, mountain there, and the idea is the, Gauss the image of the Gaussian free field here will be a Gaussian free field there. So somehow, 
these Gaussian free fields are ni behave nicely under conformal transformation on, you know, of the uh, parameter uh, space D. So it's a random area measure. It's embedded in the plane, and it has a, a natural, uh, you know, conformal structure in some way, fields, angles, uh, in some sense. Now, in that story, there's another player in 2D, which uh, is, as you might have heard, there's another approach to try to define a random two-dimensional geometry, which goes under the name planar maps. And so here I'm going to quote a result by Le Gall and Mirmont, which is, goes as follows. You choose at random, so you take n large, and you choose at random uh, you know, some quadrangulation, uh, now I have to be careful. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, so some, some random uh, graph embedded in the plane. This random graph is defined modulo diffeomorphism. Okay, so the actual embedding is not so important. You can sort of distort it. But you choose one at random among all the combinatorial ways you can do that when n is very large. That's one way to choose at random a distance, right? Because you have your graph, you have the graph distance, so this defines you a random way to define a distance among a set of n points in such a way that the actual structure is planar. So this defines you a random, you know, at, uh, for the set of n points, uh, you have a random metric on it because you, have, you, compute the, you use the graph distance metric for that. And then you have, because it's a set of n points, you can take the uniform measure on that set. And you let n be very large. So that's somehow you choose combinatorially all the you know, graphs with certain constraints on the large number of points that you do in the plane. And what Le Gall and Mirmont showed using based on some you know, bijective ways to how to encode these objects via a pair of trees, what they showed is that when n goes to infinity, this is a random metric space, a random measured metric space that this converges in the limit to an object, which is a random metric space, measured metric space, which is called a Brownian map. Okay. So this is the convergence in the sense of you know, natural convergence of random metric spaces. So you know, two metric spaces will be close. If you can couple them, you realize in some you know, larger space in such a way that you know, basically the distances are almost the same in the larger metric space. Okay, So that's another way, another approach to try to define these random geometries. So in some sense, this is the canonical random area measure that you want to define in the domain. And this is the canonical metric space. Of course, this metric space comes also with some sort of area measure, which is sort of the limit of the uniform measure of the, you know, the counting measure on your discrete space that you have here. This is an abstract metric space defined you know, up to you know, uh, uh, you know, bijective uh, things. So this one is not embedded. Even though this one is planar, graphed, it's not embedded. It doesn't come with a natural embedding in the plane. And now is the natural question. How, you know, how do these things relate to each other? And one of the important results of achievements of Scott and Jason is to say that actually these two things, when this one is square root of a third and the Brownian map are one and the same object. So how does this go? The idea is to say, well, um, if you are given the Brownian map, then there exists a way to embed this met random metric space in the plane or in the sphere in such a way that what was your area measure is exactly exponential to the square root of a third times the Gaussian free field. Okay, so you can realize exponential to square root of a third of the Gaussian free field as some embedding of the Brownian map in this, in this sphere. Conversely, what they show is that this way is actually unique. So if I'm given the area measure here, you can retroengineer it and say, well, I know which Brownian map it came from. So in a certain way, they managed to do this apparently impossible task, which is like, I'm giving you this completely crazy area measure. 
And you prove that behind the scene there is actually a metric, right? That you can find, you know, that there is a random metric behind the scene to which this random, you know, volume form corresponds to. So it shows conformal structure in this object, which is a priori not embedded, and it shows, gives the metric structure on the other side. So they sort of bridge this gap. So in some sense, just show the random, natural random way to choose a random area is the same than the random uh, way to choose a metric. Right. So that's just a brief illustration of, 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 of you know, the huge uh, scope of what they have been doing. And you know, sometimes in, in our mathematical life, we see that some people grasp simultaneously, you know, they have an intuition, they have an idea, they have a, some concrete understanding of what goes on, and then they build the, also very quickly the whole arsenal of tools, uh, you know, that enable them to move forward very fast. And then one might say they run away with it, you know, and the rest of the community might be, you know, a bit behind try to catch up and read the papers uh, as they come along, and uh, maybe feel a bit discouraged because the, the speed at which one can read papers, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's actually easier to write papers than to read papers uh, these <laughs> days. So, so um, but then in the long run, when you look back and you look at, you know, what, what will remain, what are the, you know, big achievements and, you know, what probability theory and this whole area of two-dimensional randomness, what, you know, what will stay, this is definitely one of the big pillars that, that is going to, to, to stay uh, for a for, uh, uh, yeah, long time and going to inspire uh, all the future generations uh, working in this area. Okay, so I think that's about what I had the time to say. I apologize. Uh, uh, oh yes, now I want to, of course. So I just want to advertise. I. I mean, my, my own uh, experience was that when I was, uh, whoops, when I did uh, study in Paris uh, in the old days, um, you had, um, uh, you know, I did a PhD on Brownian motion and, you know, computers didn't exist. So there were pictures of Brownian motion that were like a bit hand-drawn, you know, little, didn't look at all like, and I, I did, prove things, and then one day later I realized, oh, actually, here's a picture. It is actually quite, it's quite a fascinating object, but that was like 10 years after I started working on it. And sometimes maybe looking at the pictures, uh, it's better to look at them after you got introduced to the object rather than to see them up front. However, if you, you know, if you want, you go to uh, the website of that one of those two, uh, Jason here, uh, when you Google write Jason Miller mathematics, not just Jason Miller, otherwise you end up uh, <laughs> some other Jason Miller. And, um, and then you have all these wonderful images. So imaginary geometry is basically showing how these SLE curves are sort of directly embedded in the Gaussian free field, and you have all these very artistic visions of, uh, you know, all these, this is something that is actually drawn in, in one of these Gaussian free fields, okay? And, uh, and then, if you want to look at these, you know, embedding of, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, you know, here, this is what, you know, in the, in these type of objects, what does a metric ball look like? You know, once you embed it, it will look like some of these type of objects. Maybe that's not the right one. And, you know, uh, Sometimes you wonder, you know, you could just print that on a very nice poster, put it into your, your uh, living room and uh, explain that this is just an artistic uh, vision. Anyway, and then you have all these questions that have to do with embedding, okay? And so that's this typical idea of, you know, I have this random planar map and I try to find natural ways how to embed them in the plane and you see that some places will have many more denser points, which correspond to the higher intensity portions correspond to the Gaussian free field, and some areas are more sparsely populated. Okay, and uh, maybe I should uh, uh, conclude just mentioning very briefly that uh, they have interacted also, I mean, there's a physicist, French physicist called Duplantier that, you know, his input, I think, was uh, at some point uh, also uh, influential, and, um, and um, that I, when I teach this subject, um, I 
often have, you know, the, the nicest reward, I think, for us is then you see, you know, very gifted young student, they have, you know, sparkles in their eyes, this looks, you know, I like this object, the Gaussian free field, and uh, where what's the literature, and then I always say, well, you know, the, the, the two people, you know, two of the people who, who understood all these geometry that is hiding that, you know, they are young people, uh, much younger than me, uh, they are, you know, uh, you can talk to them and, uh, and then people are amazed that uh, this is just new mathematics uh, and uh, about some you know, fundamental questions uh, that have been around for a while. Okay, so congratulations, Scott and Jason, and uh, many thanks for uh, providing us with uh, these nice objects. I'm now going to call on Thomas Fay, who is the uh, chairman of the board of directors of the K Mathematics Institute, uh, to present uh, the medals to uh, Jason. Uh, to